they think that they're going to hate this course. And then at the end, they're like, oh my God, I loved it. Now I want to do more math. They're like, yeah, I told you so. Kind of my soul has to be at peace to be able to think on a, in a creative way. And they asked me what I did. And I said, I was doing a PhD. And they said, in what? I said, in mathematics. And the comment was, are you sure? So I would say in Brazil, I was considered actually very introverted. Oh my God. <laughs> Do they have like job openings there? <laughs> Welcome to Math Life Balance. Today, our guest is Mariana Smith Vega Garcia, an assistant professor at Western Washington University working in geometric analysis and partial differential equations. Welcome, Mariana. I'm excited to ask you about your experience in math and around. Thank you so much. Super happy that you invited me for this super cool project. Yay. <laughs> um, so in the beginning, let me ask you what brought you into mathematics? Um, let me think about this. There are several things I think like for most people, I didn't grow up knowing from a very young age that I wanted to be a mathematician, but I always enjoyed the fact that you could get easily to harder questions in math. And I also really liked the fact that there was a right answer and a wrong answer. You couldn't just, you know, kind of argue your way around the truth. So that was something that I really enjoyed. And at some point, uh, this is maybe ironic, I thought that I didn't want to become a professor because my mom was a, a professor, not in mathematics, but I thought that I didn't want to do the same thing as her. So I didn't want to be a mathematician because I thought the only thing you could do as a math mathematician was to be a professor. So I talked to some mathematicians at the time and they told me, no, you can do so many other things. So, you know, that put me at ease and I decided to go for it. And then I'm like, oh, actually I want to stay and be a professor. <laughs> <laughs> but what is, it, what is it what was so uh, scary for you in being a professor? So what I didn't want, why I didn't want to at the beginning, I think it was purely when you're a child and you don't want to follow in your parents' footsteps. There was no concrete reason. I just knew she was a professor. I thought I had to do something else, you know. <laughs> no reason. <laughs> I'm glad I was, you know, I had an open mind to check whether that was indeed the case and I changed my mind, so... <laughs> So uh, how, how different is being a professor to what you expected? Of course, I had the eyes of a child whose parents, uh, whose mother was a professor. So what did that mean at the time? That meant that my mom had to teach at night sometimes and she didn't have anybody to live me with. So she would bring me to class with her sometimes and I would sit at the back of her class while she was teaching with my crayons, drawing. And I don't know, I just knew she worked all the time. And I guess I just thought like I had to find my own path and that was not to do the same thing. <laughs> uh, so you said that you, th you expected professors to work all the time. And as you saw from the name of my channel, I'm quite curious how do people combine math and life? So do you manage to maintain some kind of math life balance and what is it for you? Um, I think the first thing I would say is that this really depends so much on the person and also on what the person wants. So I know some people who actually take, I would say like the most pleasure in their lives out of doing math. And that means that for them, whenever they have free time, uh, they want to work on math. Like for example, on Sunday, it's like a holiday because they can actually work on their research as opposed to being on committees, teaching and so on and so on. And I know people who truly are like that. Uh, I'm not like that. So I also have other interests and I so enjoy nice. exploring that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I think it is challenging for me. And I don't know if it will, it will ever be completely resolved because I also feel like you, I see other people working a lot and I feel like maybe I should be doing that. But on the other hand, it is my life. I'm the one who's supposed to be either happy or unhappy. And I'm trying to every day learn a little bit better. What is this equilibrium that I want? And ever since I started uh, working here in the state of Washington, I think that has been improving this understanding of what I actually want for my particular life, you know? So I love hiking, which is something I didn't know I actually enjoyed before I moved here. 
And I don't know, just the picture in my background. This is one of our local mountains, Mount Shaksan, close to a mm-hmm. volcano, actually. And I took this photo. I went snowshoeing there. So I've been trying to be very good about trying to, you know, just carve out days where I just go do a hike, go on a snowshoe trip, just take some time for myself. Um, but I still feel the pressure, to be honest with you. I, I think it's difficult not to. You see people who are just doing, being so productive or who reply to emails like that. And you're like, maybe I should be doing that. But then I'm like, is this everything that I want out of my life? And the answer is no. So thank you for saying this. <laughs> I think many people are now relieved watching this. <laughs> I think the important thing, I, w- I would guess I would say this, the important thing is for each person to understand what it is that they want out of their life. And if they want, like if they really love working all the time, go for it. If they also have other interests, also go for it. But there is also the issue of that, then perhaps depending on what is your interest, maybe there will be different kinds of jobs that will be better matches, let's say. So I am at an institution where research is valued, but so is teaching and I love teaching. So that works really well for me. And people there also really value having time to do fun things outside. So if I go on a hike, my colleagues will be like, yay, awesome, you know, as opposed to you should be working. That's wonderful. Um, but do you have any, so you said that it was a struggle for you to learn to uh, find time for your, uh, your other hobbies. So do you have any life hacks how to release the inner pressure to, you know, to all, always feel like you should be doing more? Because I think one of the hardest things about research besides math itself is that there, it's never enough, right? You can never... <laughs> I... That is a difficult one, if I'm honest. I felt that at least for me, one thing that was unhealthy was to be with people who wouldn't acknowledge that. So people who would put this facade of they only work and they only want to work and wouldn't acknowledge the hardship. And I'm talking about people who actually don't necessarily take full pleasure in working all the time because there are people who do and those I think it's actually easy to spot and you're like okay go for it that's what the person wants to do all the time but for those of us who also have you know worries concerns who are stressed who also want to take some time off surrounding yourself with people who also talk about it I think is very healthy because then you realize it's not just you A lot of people are putting this facade in conferences, but then they go home and they are also stressed and worried and they also struggle with the balance. So I would say try to surround yourself with people who you are close enough to talk, to have these conversations. So that's one that helps helps us remember it's not just us. Everybody's going through this or almost everybody. Um, Then I would say also think of what you want 10 years from now or 15 years from now, like what kind of life do you want? Um, And this is of course, super personal. Maybe some people will say like, I just want to have, to be able to get the best grants. I want to have papers in these journals. I want to have collaborator with these people. Okay, whatever. If that is your goal, super hundred percent, then I think, you know, that's what you have to do. Sorry, my dog is also here. If, um, if your goals for life include other things, then you are going to have to think, okay, that means that I should also prioritize times for these other things. So I think thinking about the future helps as well, because then you remember, okay, I'm working not only towards this professional goal, but all these other things in my life. So that helps you, I think, at least it helped me. Cool. You must also be closely working with some mathematicians. You have many collaborations, right? So um, how does that fit into the picture of you know, being intimidated versus uh, having similar struggle? I think that is something that maybe, maybe gets easier with time in that you start learning about more people and getting to know people better and then finding people that you work really well with. And one thing that I like is that, say my, my collaborators are friends, And when you're working with friends, if you're having like a rough period, it's easier to be understanding and vice versa for everybody, right? So if there is a time in which you can't do much or if you do more of this project than the person, it's it's easier 
And you also enjoy the time working together because it is with a friend. So I would say that this is one of the best aspects of working with other people. And then also you can have honest conversations. It's like, oh, this is a terrible week. I didn't get this grant. Or, you know, oh, I got this thing. And then the person is cheering with you. So maybe this is also a little cultural because in Brazil, we like to be friends with people that you, we interact with. So <laughs> our doctors, dentists. So of course, our collaborators as well. <laughs> Oh, that's so understandable. Um, I think it's very cool that Mati chooses with whom to work. Um, so do you have any, uh, could you tell us how your collaborations work? And more importantly, maybe, maybe you have some advice for younger people to how to start a collaboration. Um, I think it does get easier as you stay in the field longer and you know more people. So you go on a conference and then you see a talk from somebody who does something that is somehow connected to your work or connected to a question that even if it's not the same thing, connected to something that you've done, then you can talk to the person and just by chatting, sometimes projects come up. And once you have people that you work with, sometimes one person from the, let's say the group says like, oh, I've been thinking about this question. Shall we do it together? So I would say it's a, the way that it's been working with me is a lot uh, from a social aspect. It's people that you know, people you either start chatting with and try to check, you know, maybe we can do something together or people that you have already worked with and then you kind of keep going, suggest other projects later, you know. So I would say, my dog is bored. I would say, um, talk to a lot of people in conferences, um, get to know a lot of people, ask questions, try to think how is, the work that you do perhaps connected to the work that other people might do and suggest problems, suggest projects. Also ask around. If you have a good mentor, this I would suggest. Talk to somebody and say, I'm looking for, you know, younger people, for example, my, let's say my level of the career that I could work with. Do you know anybody who you think might be a good match? I don't think anybody would be offended if somebody says like, oh, hi, my name is so-and-so. I've been working on these kinds of things. I would be interested in working on this kind of stuff with you, you know. Uh, sounds easy. Uh... <laughs> I mean, there, there's always going to be some pitfalls, either a project that doesn't work or some collaboration that for one reason or another is not a good match. But then we learn, okay. And with respect to the collaborations working out or not, I think people also get better with time, like with friends, right? With time, I think we become better at knowing like, oh, I've just met this person. I think we're gonna get along, you know? Same with collaborations. <laughs> Speaking of that, Mariana, <laughs> the day we met in Essen, it was one of the happiest days. So I was doing my PhD in Essen and you were a postdoc there. And once I come to university party, where they're like mainly PTEs people, I don't know. And there was this, you know, woman who was spreading joy and warmth to the whole room. And I thought, oh, this is going to be my friend. I finally found her. Essen is never going to be gray again. And uh, this turned out to be your farewell party and your last day in Essen. And <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> There's no way to describe my disappointment. So, um, but I'm wondering, uh, from what I saw on that one time I met you, uh, you tend to be more extroverted than many mathematicians. So uh, could you tell about your experience with that? How, how do you feel in the math community? I think from my point of view, at least, this has not so much to do with being a mathematician per se, but also the groups that we go about within math and also maybe the country we're at. So I would say in Brazil, I was considered actually very introverted. Oh my God. <laughs> Do they have like job openings there? <laughs> <laughs> so sadly, I think the situation in Brazil at the moment is pretty terrible, but you should keep your eye open when, when it gets better, you know? Um, and I would say, for example, here in the US, um, after I came here to do another postdoc, I joined this group um, of Tatiana Toro, who was my mentor at the University of Washington. And this was a moment that truly changed my life, my career. And it was just so welcoming, so warm. 
everybody there was just such good friends. And, you know, so I would say it might not be only, I didn't necessarily feel that my personality didn't match with the rest of the math community. I felt at times that my personality didn't match with the specific conditions I had, let's say. Mm -hmm. And that was challenging. Um, it's, it's difficult to feel like you're one way and then perhaps the environment around you is very different. But there are many people who are more extroverted within mathematics, who are very warm, very loving, um, very friendly, who have interests that are similar to yours, to mine. 100%. I think the question is finding those environments and then making sure that that's where we are. Um, there's also lots of other issues within the math community, of course, there's a lot of sexism and other things. So again, surrounding yourself with the right people, I think is very important. Okay, let's touch upon that. So the previous interview I did was with uh, Richard Thomas, uh, who started the subject of uh, girls and boys math attitudes uh, in schools and uh, he was surprised to learn that uh, when I was growing up I was constantly told that when I would say that I want to become a math researcher as a dream I would normally be told that that's not what girls are supposed to do or what they can become and uh, okay so Richard was shocked because apparently in the progressive Great Britain uh, that's not a normal thing to say. So I'm wondering, uh, <laughs> how, how was it for you? Did you also often get such comments or no? So growing up in Brazil, I didn't. And I think, I want to say, I think I was very privileged in many ways. So first of all, my mom was a professor. She was not a math professor, but she was a professor. So I grew up thinking that being a professor as a woman is totally normal. Of course, my mom is a professor. Like it was no big deal. So that definitely helped. And there is also an interesting phenomenon that at, in Brazil, there are a lot of female math professors, or at least at the time when I did my undergrad, at least then there were several, several, several. So I had many math professors who are female. And seriously, I never had a thought like this is any, like being a woman in mathematics was not a thought that would pass through my mind. The thought was being a mathematician. And then I moved to the US and, <laughs> That changed my views. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's so unexpected. I, I expected the opposite. Yes, but no. And again, maybe it was my particular circumstances in Brazil. Perhaps if I had been brought up with different family circumstances or in another region of Brazil, maybe it would have been very different. But I moved to the US and then suddenly you see that there are so few female math professors, even within the students, it's just way less. And then you start hearing things. It's really curious comments that pop up every now and then. I remember one time I was, this was in Europe actually, I was taking a train and uh, I was just chatting with a couple in front of me and they asked me what I did. And I said, I was doing a PhD and they said, in what? I said, in mathematics. And the comment was, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> And yeah, and sometimes, you know, when people want to take your class, this is also interesting how it happens. They, they mean it super well and they are excited because they don't see so many female math professors, but then they come to you and say, I'm so excited to take your class because I've never had a female math professor. Do you see how this is also a weird thing because I mean, I'm sorry, so, but I have, and Lisa, until I moved to Germany, I've seen, I think, two female math professors. And I mean, it's extremely sad that this is the reality, but then you also become, and this is something curious, you become this kind of, how do you say this, a flag holder. Now suddenly you're carrying the flag of being a woman in mathematics. And that's also a heavy thing. Um, you want to be like, you're worrying about your own research, your teaching, your personal life. And now suddenly you're also representing a whole group of people. And it feels at times that you're also evaluated in a sense that how people evaluate you means that they are going to evaluate our category that way. And this is also not, it, it makes it very heavy, right? <laughs> so. I, I wanted to ask you about it. So you, you must be a role model for many people. So how do you, like, how do you get with this burden? 
it's also a little curious because I am Brazilian. So for Americans, that means that I am a Latina. And being a Latina is also something that is not a concept that existed in my mind as I was in Brazil. I was Brazilian, okay? <laughs> Now suddenly here, they put me in this box with all the other um, Central South American people. We also come from very different countries, but now, okay, so we are in this box. And suddenly I am representing this other box as well. And this is also something that is very curious. I'm still trying to figure out how to deal with that, along with representing, let's say, a woman mathematician. Um, I think we, it's good in one way. We have the opportunity of doing very good things. We also can inspire a lot of people in a very positive way. But there are moments in which it feels heavy because we can't just carry through our day like like worrying about just your life and your work and whatever, like many other people can, right? They don't have this thought of suddenly what I do might impact how this group of students sees these other people. So I try to remind myself that, okay, I'm going to do the best that I can always for myself because I care. And that also implies good things for this cause, let's say. But I try not to think about it on a weekly or hourly basis. Otherwise, it is a little heavy. Um, yeah, so I am actually getting starting to get scared about it myself because personally, I normally feel extremely insecure about doing math. And so this means that I often mention it and I used to just like, you know, mention it casually in the everyday basis. And now when I mention it to younger mathematicians or like future mathematicians, I start uh, thinking that, oh, but they might get an impression that like, oh, this women in math are so insecure. And then instead of, you know, pretending to be more secure, I explain to them that, no, it's just me being so insecure, which makes like, you know, like <laughs> multiplies insecurity. And then I realized that, and then, you know, <laughs> this does not go well. So I was wondering, how do you, uh, manage to uh, develop professional confidence, which you actually do spread, which is very pleasant to watch, sir. So. Oh, thank you. I, I feel a lot of insecurity all the time. <laughs> How do you hide um, it? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess maybe that's my suggestion. <laughs> Fake it until you make it, maybe. But I would say I actually do like talking about the insecurities with people who are close to me that I feel comfortable, that I know also have insecurities. Um, I am a little bit careful with that because sometimes you talk to other people who the way that they build themselves is they don't like to admit that they have insecurities. I think everybody does. But there are people that if you talk to them about this, they would be like, oh no, I don't worry about these things. I'm sure you know, I'll do well and whatever. So I'm like, okay, that's not going to help me to have that conversation with this person. But once you find somebody that you can have these conversations with, I would say, talk to them. And then when you, for example, if you want to sound confident giving a talk, I would say, practice the talk many times, say it out loud and get used to questions. That's also another moment where I think people might perceive you as being insecure, which to be honest is totally okay. But if somebody asks you a question and you don't know, just, Practice saying the words out loud. I don't know. I haven't thought about this. We can talk about it later. Just so that it's, it's less scary. And mm, I don't know. Um, I did theater when I was younger. I think that helped me a lot. I was extremely shy, extremely shy. I didn't want to leave my house even because I was so shy as a child. And oh. my mom was worried about this. So she put me in a theater group. So, you know, I think theater might be a, actually a good, a good suggestion. <laughs> But, uh, okay, so you, you mentioned already several times that you smartly choose uh, people to whom to talk to and not just uh, casually tell all the time to everyone and in every uh, YouTube video, uh, <laughs> like some oh. people here, <laughs> things like that. So uh, how do you, um, how do you, preserve confidence when you talk to students because students also ask questions perhaps often or sometimes we don't know answers so 
um, I had never had any issues with students being not super respectful towards me before the pandemic, actually. And I also feel that, okay, my theory on this topic is that because we are, I am now teaching completely online and they see me through their computer from their home, it's easier to mix a little the, the relationship we have and to feel that you know, you're just chatting with some kind of robot on the other side who's not your professor. So I think that part of the reason why this has been happening is that our professional relationship has changed because of the online teaching. So now one thing that I do, which, you know, maybe something to consider, I start my courses by introducing myself, which I usually did, but I now actually start by saying, I did my bachelor's in Brazil for years, then I did a master's for two years, then I did my PhD in the US, then I did, after the PhD, I did a postdoctoral position in Germany for two years, then I did another one. So that means that I've had X numbers of training before I started this job. And of course, this is something that we didn't, I feel a little bad that it's, it feels like I have to say this now, but it helps remind them that, you know, I'm not just some random person that's here on the computer. I actually have been training for quite a long time to be a math professor. That I think helps create this initial condition. So I'm talking in PDE terms now. <laughs> so you have this initial condition of people expect you to know what you're doing. And I think having this initial expectation is healthy. Then, of course, I prepare my classes and I do a very good job teaching. And there is no problem if they ask me something I don't know. I'll tell them, I'll think about it and talk to you later. Um, but maybe the theater thing, again, I'm thinking, because that also helps you present yourself in a certain way, right? What do you like so much about teaching? Um, ah, so many things but I hope we're gonna get back soon because online teaching is just not the same. Um, this interaction with the students, it really gives me energy, it gives me life. After a day of teaching, I would actually go back home happy. Um, when you see in the students that moment when things click and you see it in their eyes that they understood a new idea and now that is theirs, you know, this idea you're trying to explain, it's theirs now, oh, I love that moment. And, just being able to help them learn this material, realize whether perhaps they actually like math more than they thought they did. No, seriously, it's it's so much fun. I really love it. And I, I love math. It's fun talking about math. <laughs> so I feel very blessed that this is what I get to do for a living. So it's the interaction. It's the fact that maybe sometimes also the fact that you surprise them. They think that they're going to hate this course. And then at the end, they're like, oh, my God, I loved it. Now I want to do more math. I'm like, yeah, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, but you're giving lectures, right? So you like, you go to the blackboard normally and you speak for an hour, some minutes. And then why does it feel like an interaction? Okay, so um, here in the US, I don't know in Europe how much this is part of the culture. But at least where I am, they also uh, appreciate when we mix things up a bit, which means that during class, I have several moments in which I give an exercise and I either ask students to do them in groups or individually, but then I walk around and I check what they are doing so I can talk to them individually. I love that. I think it's such a great thing to do for so many reasons. Like, first of all, many students are shy at the beginning, at least here. So they feel a little self-conscious self asking a question. But when it's just you next to them, you're like, oh, tell me, what have you been trying to do? And then they tell you, and, you're, and they, then they ask a question because it's just you too. So that is really helpful to help them get to the next level. It's also fun to get to know them. But because I do this, I know my students so well. Um, I notice that now when I have to write a letter of recommendation, I do know the students really well. I know, you know, are they interested? How much can they actually do? Um, at least at that stage, right? So it is a lot of back and forth because during class, I give time for these opportunities of group work or individual work in which I walk around and help them. I like this a lot. 
I don't know if this is common in Europe. This sounds very nice and not at all like a normal lecture. <laughs> So, okay, I, I know now what you enjoy about teaching and what are your favorite parts of the math research itself? And maybe um, since you mentioned that you, you have different needs, could, could you maybe also say which like needs for you does it satisfy? I would say first, of, first and foremost, perhaps it's interesting. I just love thinking about something that I don't know and trying to solve the puzzle and learn something new so this is something that i would i would definitely miss a lot if i didn't have in my life because when you're teaching sure sometimes you learn new things but you know okay so there's so much i can talk about the second order differential equation with constant coefficient you see what i mean linear equation like yeah um but when you're doing research you get to explore questions that are always different and so I really like that. The fact that then you go and read papers from other people. So you're always learning new things. I love that. You never get bored. I, I cannot understand somebody who would feel bored with that. Um, I also love the fact that with research, I work with other people. That's also so fun. Um, I also love to see how other people work and to see how different people work. Some people work like a little every week, for example. Some people think about it a little, but don't write anything down and then write a whole chunk down in one go. Other people kind of write as you go. So I also like that. Um, but probably the most important thing for me about research that I love the most is the aspect of discovering something new and just thinking about that. Keeping me, I don't know, engaged. <laughs> And so do you have a constant presence of motivation to do research or it's like fluctuates or how, how does it work? No, it changes. It also changes according to the project, according to my moment in life, definitely. Sometimes there is a project that you start and then as you go along, you discover that you need to do something for that to, to be done. And that something is just such a pain, like so technical, such a long thing. And you know it's true but you have to write it down, right? And then, God, it's such a pain to do it. So it's difficult to find motivation for me to do those parts. Um, also, if I have a moment in life that's very challenging from a personal point of view or you know something is going on, it's difficult for, for me as well to sit down and think about math. I feel like my kind of my soul has to be at peace to be able to think on a, in a creative way. So... When that happens, I feel like the teaching helps because at least I have something else that I need to do. So I get that done and I feel like I've accomplished something. <laughs> so during those periods of time, you still feel like you're productive. Um, then there is also the issue of how do you balance different collaborations or different pieces of work that are happening at the same time? That I'm still struggling with. I find it difficult. Um, it's kind of nice if you have different projects at the same time. If you get stuck in one, okay, you have the other one to work with, so you can, you know, get something done on the other one. That's great. But on the other hand, I also feel that it's sometimes better to focus on one. So you focus all of your mental energy into one thing to get it done and then move on to the other one. So I still, I still don't know exactly how best to deal with that problem. <laughs> How many projects are you trying to work on at this, well, simultaneously? Or do you know well, how many projects you have right now? <laughs> so that's another question. Do I consider some on the back burner, let's say? So let's say on pause, maybe. So like actively working on two, but I have some other things on the back burner. It's like volcanoes, right? Sorry? Sleeping volcanoes. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Nice. So actually, uh, I'm also wondering how is it different for you? So uh, yeah, I'm sorry to put you in yet another box, but on my channel, you do represent a minority, the minority of analytic side of mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> that one you didn't mention. <laughs> no, do <did> not. <laughs> so at least some change for you. <laughs> um, I thought of inviting you uh, because a friend of mine wrote me that 
Uh, so she's do doing PDEs, something related to PDEs, and she watched just a couple of videos and she said, Mura, that's very nice all you're doing, but you're only talking to algebraic people and in our world everything is different. And I was like, well, what is different? Uh, <laughs> so uh, I don't know, uh, but do you know maybe of any differences in, I don't know, in our math communities or in the way the work goes between like algebraic and analytic sides of math? I have friends who work more on the algebraic side and okay my impression of from from what i gather from seeing them is that it's not so different it's just a different maybe we are dressed in different clothes but it's the same thing uh -huh. the impression i have is that for people who work in truly applied math then it is a different universe uh -huh. but i don't know for algebra do you think it is different I imagine that you guys have shorter projects and because you, you like the list of publications is usually longer. <laughs> so I imagine that you're happier people who can get something done in the like shorter amount of time. Okay, I think then you have to look at the sub boxes within our box because there are people who write in some fields where the papers are huge. I have papers that are like 70 pages. I would not cl classify that as short. Maybe. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends. But <laughs> I see. Interesting. So uh, in this, I work in this free boundary community, and in free boundaries, some of the papers are really huge as well, and take a, quite a long time to get done. Um, but for example, now that I remember that friend told me that um, she would disagree with some one of the interview interviewees <laughs> who said that uh, for us uh, the main thing is uh, the result like the mathematical statement the fact not its proof like that the proof is secondary and less important and she said in 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 her world it would be different uh, what would so I, I I agree with your friend but I wonder if this is just a personal feeling as opposed to more of an area um, I definitely, okay, maybe I would say that I imagine most people who work in PDEs have a good feeling of what they're trying to do. So whether it is correct or not, hmm. I would say that we, we start by kind of having a good intuition, whether it should be true or not. And then the proof is really the most important part. But on the other hand, there are results that we think should be true, but the, until we have a proof, it's not true, right? So... <laughs> For me, the proof is the most important part. I, maybe a comment. I, I do remember at some point talking to a person from applied math, and I was trying to explain what I did. And I was trying to say that I was trying to prove that this solution of this PDE had to have some kind of regularity. And the person said, why don't you assume it's infinity to begin with? <laughs> We would lose our salaries if we could assume. It. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, oh wait, I had a question. I lost it. Ah, so uh, are you often uh, in a situation in your research that you believe something should be true, but you don't know how to prove it? Um. Well, in a sense. Okay, this is my posture with mathematics, and I know that other people feel very differently. A lot of people are very confident in the math work. And by that, I mean, when they start doing a proof, they are like, I'm sure it's going to work. And some people truly feel this way. And I am very pessimistic, which I think I would like to change a little. But I'm very optimistic in life. But when I do work, I'm like, it's always not true until it's completely written down. And because of that, whenever I'm trying to do a proof, I feel like, no, it's not going to work out. It's not going to work out. It's not going to work out. But then it does, and sometimes it doesn't. But you know, <laughs> I think it would be better if I had this posture of like, it is going to work out. It is going to work out. Uh, are there other differences between you in mathematics and you outside? Ah, uh, I think that is the biggest one, and I think this is a product of some of my experiences as a mathematician. It has made me a more pessimistic and cautious person. 
Um, in life nowadays, I am more optimistic and maybe I can say I'm friendly and <clears throat> outgoing. And with mathematics, I'm more conservative. Um, that is part of, I think, how I got trained at the beginning of my career. But I think I would also like to change that. Um, some people have much more fun doing math because they are not afraid of whatever they're doing not working out. And I would like to go more in that direction. <laughs> but how to connect more to the world if, like, if you're within this bubble? I know it's difficult because I think as academics, we spend so much of our time surrounded by academics. Many of our friends are academics. Um, so it's, it's not just work, right? It's not like nine to five and then the work is done and you go back to whatever other things. No, it's on the weekend, you go to the conference. Your friends are perhaps also mathematicians and then you hang out with them and talk about mathematics and mathematicians and the politics and so on. Mm -hmm. um, the way I try to deal with this is finding hobbies outside of math. Not because I'm trying to escape math, but because I also have other interests. So try to cultivate that and remind yourself of that. Um, sometimes having friends outside of academia is also very eye-opening. You talk to them and they're like, yeah, okay, so something didn't work at work. So what? Now it's the weekend. Let's have a good time, you know. And they don't get consumed by everything that is work-related. I like that. Yeah, but I don't understand how they manage not to be consumed. <laughs> it's very hard to relate to people who don't uh, feel so emotional about their work. I feel very emotional, but I think maybe what I'm trying to say is I think we, we identify ourselves so much with being mathematicians that if that part of our life is not going as well as we wanted, we feel really bad as people. And that I think is important to remember. We are more than just mathematicians, which is not to say we shouldn't love our jobs and we shouldn't want to, you know, and we shouldn't care. I super care. And of course, when things don't work out, I get upset. But your self-worth, your value as a person, it's not just about you being a mathematician. There's more to you than that. So that, I think, is what, um, let's say, the outside world reminds me of. If I stopped being a mathematician today, would I be a worthless person? No. Would I find something else to do? Yes. Would I like it as much? No, but I would still be happy. I think that doesn't mean that I don't love my job. I fought really hard to get a job like this, and I love it. But I am also a person besides the job, I think. Okay, so this is the question which always bothers me when people say this. I don't understand how can one combine passionately loving their job and imagining being happy without it? Okay, maybe this is a very silly comparison, but you know when you talk about uh, relationships and some people say, oh, you're going to have one love in your life. And some people say, no, you're going to, there are many people in this world that you could love very much. And I don't think I would quite love other jobs as much as I love math, but I would still find other things to do with my life that I would quite like. That's what I think. I see. What would be an example of such a job, of a different job? Um, mm, let me think about this. I would probably be a therapist, I think. Hmm, interesting. Or um, I have an issue with blood. If I could get around that, I would probably be a vet. I also love pets, so. <laughs> I see. Um, and so you mentioned that you moved a lot, like to, to US, to Germany, to US, um, which is something many mathematicians go through. So what is your experience with changing continents? Oh, did it feel like a sacrifice or like a cool thing or like a privilege? I don't know. Um, I think this might, so in my personal example, uh, being able to go to the US for my PhD was a huge opportunity. Um, 
unbelievable. I was just so happy, so grateful that I could do that. Um, then I moved to Germany and I think maybe because my experience in the US had been so amazing, so welcoming. I had so many friends, everything was just, okay, of course there are bad things always everywhere, but overall my experience had been so fantastic. I was also a bit naive with how I expected Germany to be. I think I thought it wouldn't be so culturally different from my own culture. I also didn't speak a word of German. So when I moved to Germany, I kind of had this idea that because I had graduated with my PhD, I would be a postdoc, somehow certain things would be easier. And I think in general, it was all much harder. And that felt like a sacrifice in a sense, even though it was a professional opportunity, but life-wise I had a very difficult time. And then when I moved back to the US, that felt like, oh my God, I cried. It was extremely grateful to be able to come back to a place that I knew that had treated me so well, where I had so many friends and Washington state is just, unbelievable i love this place <laughs> so oh, that's, that's so great to hear but that's not to say it's not hard right um it's really difficult to be away from family um it was always difficult but now during the pandemic it's particularly difficult i haven't been able to go back to brazil in almost two years god knows when i'm going to be able to go back to visit my family um it's really hard. And sometimes you are lonely. Sometimes things don't work out. But if you're able to make friends, I think everything is just so much better. Also, if you are in a place where there are lots of international people, that is also easier because they will also be in a situation like you. So there are lots of sacrifices, but I'm extremely grateful that I got to do it. I know some people don't like moving and if I'm honest, let's say I wanted to, I wanted to get married and have children, for example, earlier. That would have been really, really, really challenging. How do you move around with a family if everybody has jobs, if you have children? That's a huge, huge problem. So may I ask, if you don't mind, what were the hardest things about being in Germany, like the lack of friends? I think it was a combination of many things. Um, I didn't speak the language and I think I was naive in thinking that that would not be an issue. So this was hugely difficult for me to make friends. I think I did not expect the culture to be so different. So sometimes I even felt, like you said, I was warm and friendly and so on. I felt that that was seen as kind of a, a weird thing. That's not to say for every, by everybody, definitely not. I actually still have very good friends that I met in Essen, but it took a very long time to make friends. <laughs> then uh, there were, maybe I was very unlucky in other ways, but I got robbed in Essen. Um, the police officers, uh, I can say so many things about those things. We might end up just talking about this, but the police officer said, oh, I'm sure it's the same in Brazil. You know, kinds of, after you're robbed, that's the comment the police makes for you. I got super sick. They sent me to the tropical disease unit of the hospital, even though I had not been in Brazil for many months. So there were various aspects of life that were very challenging. And I think, again, maybe this was just pure luck. But after having lived in the US where things are really easy from a bureaucratic point of view, you move to Germany, which is worse than Brazil in bureaucratic terms, that's also a shock. So suddenly you have to deal with so many pieces of paperwork, all of them in German, of course. Um, everything had to be sent by letter or in person, like no emails. It was challenging. I see. Well, I'm sorry. It's okay. So um, uh, I have a question. I'm not sure if there is any possible answer, but maybe you have some advice. So um, sometimes I get contacted by students from um, countries which are not Europe or US. So countries, some countries where mathematics is 
less developed or it is highly developed, but they're just far from some like centers. Um, and they ask, you know, how to, how to get to a PhD, how to get to know people, how to get involved. And uh, I, I don't know how to imagine being far from the whole math community. So do you know what, which advice can one give to students in um, so yeah, at least in terms of the US, we have a very kind of standardized admissions process for the PhD. And the admissions, it's very different from Europe. The deadlines are always around the end of the year. So like November, December, January. So everybody should take a look at that and apply. And I would say try to apply to as many places as possible because it is very competitive. Um, but in so, Europe, you have to pay every time you apply for a PhD position, right? So you cannot apply to all the universities. In Europe. Well, it depends. Many universities have, uh, like, they, they, they say that you don't have to pay a fee if you satisfy certain requirements. So many universities have, for example, um, if you don't have a lot of money, you can actually not pay the fee. So that's also something that I would say it's important to, to take a look. But I remember at my time, it was a lot of money to apply. And do you know what's important when one applies for a PhD program? What actually plays a role uh, for, for submission? Um, so, of course, it will depend a little bit on the particular university you are applying. If they ask for these, so there are these scores that American institutions usually require. They're called the GRE. So this is a standardized test. Um, so the the test, if the school asks for it, I would say the, the grade matters. Not that it has to be like fantastic, but if it is very low, it's a problem. Um, sorry, doggy, he or she is. Um, then the letters of recommendation. And here it becomes challenging because if you come from a country where none of the professors who know you have connections internationally, that might be difficult. It might be difficult because when you read a letter from an institution you don't know, by somebody you don't know, you don't know what the letter means. Mm -hmm. So if there, is, there are professors from your institution who perhaps have international connections, talk to them, ask who they know, which, which institutions do they know somebody that might be helpful. So speaking of competitivity, I've uh, seen on your webpage that uh, you do um, work in committees or uh, organizations to help to or underrepresented minorities in mathematics, right? So yes. um, I wonder what are the main aspects that you'd like to improve in that direction? Uh, so many things, <laughs> there's still many things to be improved. Um, there is this issue that uh, talking about the US here, just because I'm working here at the moment, but the representation of minorities in mathematics is, is really something that needs to improve. So you go to a conference and sometimes I'm the only woman, you know, definitely everybody else looks very white. So things like that to try to improve representation. Um, and there are several things that people can do. So there is the Association for Women in Mathematics. They have various initiatives that are, you know, things can help. So for example, they have a essay contest. So students from schools, depending on their age, so there are different uh, layers of competition. So for example, really young kids, high school kids, you also have undergraduates, they can write an interview with a woman mathematician and submit the, let's say the, the story that they wrote about this. And people can help judge those. So that's something. There was a really interesting, idea they created a deck of cards in which in one side you have games and on the other side you have short biographies of women mathematicians and they needed people to write those biographies to help select who's going to appear in the deck of cards so you see there are many interesting things that we can do that also help promote women mathematicians for example so there are many many things that people can do and i also want to mention Nobody needs to belong to a minority to help with these initiatives. Absolutely not. Sometimes people feel that they wouldn't be welcome or they are just worried that perhaps they shouldn't participate if they don't feel like they belong to that minority, but absolutely not. 
I think it would be even better if people who don't identify also participate, because then you also understand better what are the issues that we are facing. So speaking of that, uh, I started some time ago, maybe a few years ago, uh, trying to read, um, well, whatever internet writes about problems that different groups of people are facing in order to understand better. And uh, it turned out to be, unfortunately, addictive. So <laughs> I read about more social injustice. I notice it more in life. I think more about it. Facebook offers me more articles about it. I read more and it's on. So how do you not get obsessed with social injustice if you generically care? <laughs> it's difficult. Um, I am also currently the community ambassador for the math department for my university. So that means that they came up with a position. So it's a faculty member who is a point of contact for students, staff, and professors who have issues related to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And let me tell you, sometimes it, it really is a depressing thing to do because, of course, you have to talk to people who are going through issues. And it's sad to see this happening all the time. And then you also kind of you get consumed by worrying about it and wanting to help everybody and all the issues. And this kind of sometimes it becomes heavy as well. So I'm trying to kind of tell myself I cannot fix everything all the time, but I can do something to help things. So trying to not, not put all the responsibility on yourself. Do things, absolutely, right? But also remember, um, it is a heavy burden and it's important to share the burden. So I think that's also good to, to think about. For example, I'm not going to do this job as the community ambassador after the year is over, the academic year is over because my term is over. And on the one hand, I'm feeling like I should be doing even more. But then on the other hand, I feel like it's also good that somebody else takes the position because then they also will learn more about these issues and can also contribute. And I can use that time to another cause that I can also, you know, try to improve. So maybe choose your battles. Remember that your career is a long thing. It's not just today. So you can do things at all stages of your career and it's okay not to do all of them now. Uh, does this, this position feel like partly satisfying your other wish to be a therapist or? <laughs> uh, sometimes, um, yes. I also feel that a Maybe this is my take on being a teacher. I think being a teacher in a sense is a little bit also being kind of a therapist sometimes to students because many times the person is having problems that you see through their schoolwork, but the problems are other. And sometimes just saying, is everything okay? And then the person talks to you and clearly they needed to talk to somebody or they just wanted to you know, discuss the issue and then that was an opportunity for you to see. And I like that about teaching as well. It's a chance for you to see people, see really what's going on. I see. Yeah, that is true. So what do you wish you knew about math research when you were a student yourself? Um, I would say, I wish I knew how important it was to practice being patient and learning that things not working out is not a problem. So that not something not working out is just part of the process. So I would train myself from an earlier age to just sit for you know a long time and just try different ideas without any kind of fear or concern whether they're going to work out or not. Just to practice being comfortable with the unknown. Um, I also wish I had, do I wish I had known? Maybe that the path to become a professor is really difficult. It does come with many challenges, but it's also super rewarding. So if, from my point of view, it was worth it, <laughs> but definitely the having to move, the, the stress until one gets a job is real. And it's, it's really difficult to get a job. So I would say it's also important to consider what is your plan B? Like, what would you do if you don't get a job that you want? 
what would you do? Yeah, sounds that's a, that's a practical advice that's not fun to say, but you know. So let me ask you the last question. What is your advice to young mathematicians? Get to know a lot of people, ask questions. Something that I was advised to do when I was younger, and I think it was great advice. Learn a lot of math when you have the time. I did not realize this. I thought people were exaggerating. I remember during my PhD, people said, learn a lot of math. Even if you don't think you're going to need Riemannian geometry right now, take it now because later you're not gonna have enough time to sit and learn all of this. And I was like, okay, so I did take Riemannian geometry, for example, and I take, took many courses and it was great because I had no idea how much busier we become later in the career and how much more precious time is. So take the time when you're a student to learn as much math as you can, seriously. Really, really, really. Take many classes. No, seriously. And it's fun. You're gonna learn so many things. It's also going to help you understand which area of math you want to work on. Later, you might see connections between fields that you hadn't thought of. So take a lot of classes, ask a lot of questions find good mentors that's maybe also super important people who are supportive that you trust you can talk to and work hard <laughs> <laughs> and find math friends so you can also you know complain together when something doesn't work out celebrate together when something does work out go to conferences together that's also so fun thank you for so many good advice Oh, you're very sleepy, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> She's shy. I finished some videos with like pictures of animals and now we'll have an actual animal. Oh, you have an animal, yes. <laughs> Thank you both.